Okay, welcome back, guys. Uh, uh, let's pick up from where we stop. Uh, the early church also preached the cross of Christ. Right, so right now, when we look and we read the book of Acts, we see everywhere the cross was preached. Now, let, let's look at a few instances uh, where the cross of Jesus Christ was preached and what is the effect of that preaching. Uh, so we look at a few instances. First one, the very first sermon of the church when, uh, when you know, Peter, the, the whole the baptism of the Holy Spirit came uh, on Pentecost, came upon those uh, people praying in the upper room. And then what happened? Peter got an opportunity. What does he say here? Acts 2, 22 to 24, very, very common uh, portion of scripture. It says, Acts 2, 22 to 24, men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders and signs, which God did through him in your midst, as you yourself also know, him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands, have crucified and put to death. When God raised him up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be held by it. So here Peter, he gets this opportunity and people are saying, hey, why are these people drunk in the morning time and they're screaming and shouting and but Peter stands up and he, he quotes Joel as well. And he says, men and women, this is what has happened. And he brings the whole message in a very, very simple way. You know that there was a man named Jesus of Nazareth. You know that he was attested by God because of the miracles and the great signs and wonders that he did. And you have seen it. And now... By lawless hands, he has been put to death. But the Lord, but God has raised him up, and now he's alive. Simple gospel. Three points Christ crucified, resurrected from the dead. Now, what was the you know effect or what was the outcome of that message? Ten thousand people were added into the church. Now, was it something that you know, why didn't Peter, you know, what, what if Peter had gone up on that platform and said, you know, men and women, uh, when Jesus was 30 years old, he chose us. I was fishing. My brother was also fishing. And then when he chose us, there was, uh, we were all 12 of them. And one day we went here and we saw this wonderful miracle that we went into Samaria. Then we saw that Jesus turned, uh, you know, he brought, life to this woman and then he did this he did that no right and peter doesn't do that what does he do he says this is what you'll have done there was a man named jesus you'll have crucified him but now he's resurrected and he's alive he put to death uh the sting of death has been uh defeated simple message Ten thousand people added into the church second the healing of the lame man, right? There was a lame man and, uh, you know, uh, he was there many years. Acts 4, 8 says, And Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders of Israel, begins to preach the gospel. If we this day are judged for a good deed to, done to, help, to this helpless man, that is, remember that helpless man says, give me some arms. And Peter says, silver and gold have I not. But what I have, I'll give to thee in the name of Jesus Christ. Rise up and walk. Acts 4.10. Let it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel, but that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man stands before you. Verse 11. This is the stone which was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. And very brilliantly, Peter ends that whole sermon and he says, Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Here, P 
Peter, he brings healing and then he's, he shares the gospel to them. He doesn't bring healing to this lame man and say, okay, just go away. No, he, he brings healing and he says, you all may be wondering how this lame man is standing. I'll tell you how. And he brings the whole you know, aspect of the cross. Jesus Christ, whom you crucified, God raised from the dead. And by his power, by him, this man stands before you. When Be assured that when we preach the cross of Jesus Christ, we will see signs, miracles, and wonders. We will see it. We will see it in our lives. We will see it in our family. We will see it as testimonies in our churches, in our congregations, in meetings. We will see it because the cross of Christ is the power of God. Right? So I'm not. We are not trying to say that you know uh, we have to only sit and study about only the cross. No. Here's the beautiful part, right? It's a simple message. Jesus Christ, he came, he died on the cross, he rose from the dead. And now he's alive, he's willing to forgive our sins and take us as, as, as his child or uh, child and daughter. Now, it does not mean that we don't study other things from the Bible, right? There are other many, many aspects of God we study about you know, you know, faith and Christology and all these other subject revelations. All of that is important. But when all that we study, if it does not converge to the cross, converge to what Jesus did for us on the cross, then it's going to be a failure. It's just going to be head knowledge. Right? So if you're studying revelations, you're saying, okay, this is all going to happen in the end times, you no know, persecution, this and this and this. But if our eyes and our hearts don't turn towards what Jesus did for us on the cross, even when we are studying that, then that becomes head knowledge. Right? It just becomes knowledge that we have. Every aspect from the Bible points us to the cross. Every prophecy in the Old Testament points us to the cross. So when we read, when we study the word of God, make sure that we're not just studying it for you know head knowledge or to pass our exams and all of that. It's to get a deeper revelation of the cross and what Jesus did for us. Another place where the, we see in the early church, what they did was they preached the gospel when they faced and when they were faced with persecution and threats. Let's read Acts chapter 5, 27 to 32. Yes, could anyone please read that? Acts 5, 27 to 32. Acts 5, 27 to 32. Yes, could anyone please? And when they brought them, they set them before the council, and the high priest asked them, saying, Did we not strictly command you not to teach in this name? And look, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood on us. But Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God, we ought to obey God rather than men. The God of our, the God of our fathers rests up Jesus, whom you murdered by hanging on a tree. Him God has, exa has exalted to his right hand to be prince and savior, to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are his witness to these things, and so also is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. Amen. Thank you, Zeli. So we see here that... Peter and John were brought into questioning, right? And they said, see, we told you, don't preach about this man named Jesus. But what's happening? You're filling this whole place with this doctrine. You're filling Jerusalem, Judea. People are all talking about Jesus. And now it's as if that we have murdered him and his blood is upon our hands. And what does Peter say? You know, they are threatening Peter. They're saying, don't preach. Anything can happen if you continue with this. Peter says, 
we ought to obey God rather than man. Uh, you can say a lot of things, O oh priest, or oh high priest. You can say a lot of things, but we ought to obey God rather than man, because the God whom, uh, whom you have murdered, the Lord Jesus whom you have murdered by hanging on the tree, him God exalted above the nations. And so we must obey him. And so the Holy Spirit whom God has given to us, we must obey him as well. So even in the face of persecution, even in the face of threats, the same Peter who was fearful and, and you know, running away, saying here, no, no, we need to obey God. We need to obey what the Holy Spirit is teaching us and telling us. And so we will do what God told us to do or tells us to do. We will be a witness to these things. So whether you put us in prison, whether you castrate us out of the, out of this place, or whether you you know you beat us and you take things away from us, we will not change the message that we are going to preach. That is the cross crucified, right? Then we also see the first sermon to the Gentiles where the cross was preached. And then we see that in Paul's first missionary journey, the cross was preached. Everywhere Paul went, he preached the gospel. Remember in the Galatians, he goes to the Galatians, he preaches the gospels. Many of them accept the gospel, but then later on they turn away and they say, go back to circumcision. But he goes on and he corrects them, he rebukes them, he exhorts them. Listen, the cross of Christ will be made of no avail if you go back to the, the circumcision and the things of the past. And we studied all of that in the covenants. So the main focus of the disciples, the early church, Apostle Paul, was the cross. And so we, as we are leading the church, leading ministries, leading Bible studies, whatever we are doing, let the main focus be the cross. Now, one of the wrong understandings is whenever we preach the cross, we may feel sometimes, you know, why to talk about death? Let's talk about the power of God or let's talk about God's faithfulness or let's talk about, you know, these wonderful miracles. Right? Let's not talk about death and, you know, all that beatings and all the things that happened to Jesus. You know, he was nailed to the cross. The blood was dripping out of his body. They pierced his side, the crown of thorns. Why do you talk about all these gruesome things? Anyway, Jesus is resurrected now. Let's talk about these wonderful miracles that Jesus has done. Five loaves of bread, two fish, changing water into wine. Let's spend our time on that. Remember what Apostle Paul said? The message of the cross is the centrality of the cross, of, of everything that we do. If we focus on all the miracles and all of those things, but we forget about why those miracles are happening or through whom it is happening and how it's happening, which is through the cross, then the whole value of this message changes. Right? Always remember, there will be many times people will come and tell you, oh, very good preaching, very good teaching, very good worship leading. It's good. You, know, you appreciate them. You say, okay, praise God for that. But one of the ways that I always, always look and, you know, uh, 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 test what I'm doing is to see that whether I was in line with what I'm singing or preaching or whether I was able to bring, you know, the Holy Spirit bringing the power of the cross and touching lives, transforming lives. That's the whole point. It's not about a, a whole band and a whole show and, you know, have these wonderful songs. There are times for all of that. But it's more about transforming lives. It's more about the cross. The main message of the church was the cross. If you're not preaching the cross, we are not preaching the gospel at all. Remember that. If we are not preaching the cross, we are not preaching the gospel. We are just preaching other stuff. Or we are just good oratory uh, 
people, our main message must be the cross of Jesus Christ. Don't be ashamed of it. Don't feel that people may not accept it. Don't feel that people may mock you, ridicule you, make fun of you. If, if they do, it's all right. Remember, the audience cannot change the message of the cross. The cross remains, the power remains, uh, the authority remains, the victory remains, whether people believe it or not. So it's our responsibility, right? Uh, the simple gospel that we preach is able to touch and transform lives. And it's able to bring a lot of changes into people's lives. Right. So we move on from here. Uh, we looked at the cross. We, uh, I'm sure a lot of it is a repeat. Let's look at a few of the shadows of the cross. Now, you will also be, uh, you would have studied this in Christology as well. Uh, the Old Testament points to Jesus and his work on the cross. Right. Uh, you see that immediately after the resurrection, the Lord Jesus begins to speak to his disciples and he points them to the Old Testament. Remember the Lord Jesus in, in Luke 24, he meets with the disciples. The disciples are fearful and he says, why are you fearful? I'm fulfilling what the uh, old covenant prophecies say. I'm fulfilling what our forefathers spoke of. Let's read Luke chapter 24, 25 to 27 and 44 to 47. Luke 24, 25 to 27. Yes, anyone can please read. Luke 24, Luke 24 25 to 27. Then he said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of her to believe in all that the prophets have spoken ought not the Christ to have suffering these things and to enter into his glory and beginning at and beginning at Moses and all the prophets he he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself yes and Zeli also to verse 44 to 47 okay then he said to them, These are the words which I have spoken to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which, uh, which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. And he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. Then he said to them, Thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ, for the Christ to suffer and to rise uh, and to rise from the dead the third day and their repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name to all nations beginning at jerusalem amen thank you zeti so here the lord jesus is resurrected he's he's meeting his disciples and he's telling his disciples everything that has happened till now is what the scriptures have been told of. Moses has spoken about it and everything concerning me that has been written has now been fulfilled. The Lord Jesus, it's very interesting. Now think about this. The Lord Jesus didn't come and say, okay, see, now you all killed me. No, I'm alive now. He didn't just say that, right? You, you see the wisdom of God. It's not like a one event thing. Say, okay, you killed me, now I've overcome death, I'm here, and I'm victorious. Yes, that is true. But he's, the Lord Jesus is trying to bring this whole thing of saying that it was a planned thing. It's not that, you know, they they caught me, I was, you know, I'm here, they, the, the Romans caught me, they took me forcefully, they took me to uh, this place, and then they put me into prison, they scourged me, they forcefully carried me, put me on the cross, and they killed me, but still I overcame death, and now I'm alive. No, the Lord Jesus doesn't say that. He says, it is something that has already been written about me hundreds of years ago. It's been written. Moses wrote it written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. 
right? And thus, what was written about me has been fulfilled. So he's trying to tell his disciples, this don't don't be sad or don't be worried or don't be uh, you know asking all these questions. Why did Jesus die? Where is he? And all of these things. But remember, the scriptures are spoken, and I have fulfilled it. So it's not something new for you. It is something that's already been written. But now, since it's fulfilled, now you can believe it. Let's look at a few more places where the Lord Jesus begins to, uh, you know, uh, we see the foreshadowing of the cross, the seed of the woman. Uh, Genesis 3.15, we know this, and I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Whatever Jesus did on the cross was he crushed the work of the devil. Romans 16.20, and the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. That's what the book of Genesis talks about. You see the foreshadow. God tells Adam and Eve, you have sinned, but my seed will crush your seed. And Jesus did that on the cross, fulfilling what was spoken of. Genesis 3.21 also. Also for Adam and his wife, the Lord made tunics of skin and clothed them. Covering of sins can be provided only by the shedding of blood. And this is what uh, the works of man will not cover sin. So this was the first place where God himself made an offering. And he said, the, these tunics of, of skin, you cover yourself with it. Again, fulfilling a prophecy later on. A sacrifice that will be so greater that will not only cover sins, but it will it will. For bring forgiveness of sins. And we look at Abel's sacrifice as well, right? Where, you know, Adam and, let's read Genesis 4, 1 and 5, 1 to 5. Now, Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain and said, I have acquired a man from the Lord. Then she bore again, this time his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of the sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. Abel also brought the, of the firstborn of his flock and their fat. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering, but he did not respect Cain and his offering. Cain was very angry and his countenance fell. Worship that will be accepted by God comes based on the shedding of blood. Right, And Hebrews 11.4 says, By faith Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained witness that he was righteous. Then we also look at God's provisions for Abraham's sacrifice. This we all know. Abraham takes Isaac, goes up that mountain. He's going to get ready to kill uh, Isaac. God stops him and says, No, don't kill your son. Take him off. Look, there's a uh, there's a, a ram there stuck by its horns. Take that and offer it. That's again portraying or foreshadowing of what Jesus did. The Passover lamb. We studied this also, where the blood of the lamb was put on the post, and that and sin and death could not come in. And same way, the blood of the lamb is able to, uh, you know, break. The curse of sin and death. The rock from which the water flowed in Exodus 17. God told Moses, smote that rock. He hid it and water came out of that rock. And that water followed them wherever they went. The book of Hebrews says that rock was Jesus. Second time, God told Ab uh, Moses, you speak to the rock. But he hid it again. Right? He did not understand. And, and hence, you know, uh, uh, it became a whole big issue later on where God says, you're not going to enter the promised land because the message that God wanted to convey was a type that this rock will, that will be struck will be struck only once. Again, to convey what 
Jesus did on the cross. And then we look at Levitical offerings and sacrifices, the burnt offering, sin offering, trespass offering, peace offering. All of these offerings point to the cross, foreshadowing of the cross. The Day of Atonement, again, we studied about that in Covenants, where how the high priest takes the blood, goes into the most holy place, and he offers that blood. Now, uh, for the nation, for himself, and for the entire nation of Israel. Uh, and he took care of the man's side of asking God for forgiveness. And so here we look at, look at how Jesus fulfilled every aspect of the high priest. Uh, and he did even more than that. And we studied that as well. And we look at the serpent in the wilderness. Right. I'm just going quickly. I know that we all know this, but I'm just trying to bring out these points, the shadows of the cross, the serpent in the wilderness. God is upset, says you people are sinning, constantly living in sin. So he sends serpents among the people which killed many of the Israelites. Uh, but then Moses cries out to God. God says, okay, put a brass pole, put a serpent on it. Those who get bit, you look at that, you will live was again to depict what Jesus would do later on All right and finally we see uh, he who hangs on a tree Deuteronomy sorry Matthew 27 57 to 60 uh, let's read Matthew chapter 27 57 to 60 let's just read that Matthew 27, 57 to 60. Now when evening had come, there came a rich man with Arimathea, named Joseph, who himself had also become a disciple of Jesus. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. When, then Pilate commanded the body to be given to him. When Joseph had taken the body, he wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and laid it in his new tomb, which he had hewn out for, of the rock. And he rolled a large stone <clears throat> against the door of the tomb and departed. Amen. Thanks, John. Uh, so, now this is very, very important. right? Usually, uh, the Romans, what they would do is, there were two things. One, they would typically, those who were crucified had lost all authority. So, uh, when you, you when we study more about uh, crucifixion and all that, you know the worst criminals were given a crucifixion, right? The worst of them all. And the moment you're being crucified, you're on the cross. You have lost all authority as a human being. People can throw garbage at you. People can lepers can come and you know. Usually, you know, we, uh, during these uh, th those times, the lepers were cast away. They were put away from the city. So that's why when Jesus was walking towards Samaria, when the leper came, uh, the other Jews, the disciples were all like, stay away. Jesus goes and brings healing because the lepers have a designated place. Even a leper could come and, you know, spit on the cross or sp do anything. They will not stop them. Because it was the most humiliating death. What they would also do is, the Romans would, many times, they would leave the body on the cross itself. And vultures and the birds of the air would come and feed on it. And eventually the, the, the bones, the skeletons, it would just fall off. Later on, they would take that cross and you know, just dispose it. Or... Second thing they would do is, since many times people were being crucified uh, on main roads, on the pathways of ro uh, the roads of Rome, and, uh, and, and so what they would do is, they would take the bodies off the cross, and they would just throw away the body, dump it somewhere away in Jerusalem, far away. And so again, the birds of the air and animals would come and just eat of it, and they were not even given a proper funeral because they lost all rights. They are not considered a human being. Now, Jesus was willing. That's why, that's why, you know, when we study all of this, 
scriptures become so much more meaningful. Remember the book of Hebrews? What does it say? He made himself lower than angels and he made himself obedient to death, even death on a cross. Did you ever wonder why, why, why was that verse there? He made himself obedient to death, even death on a cross. That means not only death to the worst form of death, Jesus made himself obedient to it. But here, the Lord Jesus, remember he said, I will die, I will raise again on the third day. I will, be, I will die, I will be buried, and I will raise again on the third day. He used the word buried. Joseph of Arimathea comes, asks for the body. Now the Romans had all the authority to take Jesus' body and just throw it away. Or the high, Romans, Pilate could have said, no, let the body be there. I'm not going to give the body. But that is not uh, uh, something that you know happened. Why? Because prophecy must be fulfilled. The psalmist also writes, not even one bone in his body was broken. Can you picture that? Jesus was beaten and bruised and his whole body was scourged. Only flesh was taken out of him, but not one bone in his body was broken. Now, history says that the Romans, once they were on, uh, a person is on the cross and it's time up, you know, sometimes they don't die. They take a long time to die. So they would take, uh, you know, long wooden logs of wood and they would start breaking the, you know, the ribs and the uh, knees, the ankles, the bones. They start breaking them so that, you know, death is faster. But... Not one bone of his was broken. To point, every prophecy was fulfilled. He was taken, Joseph of Aramete, a rich man who was a disciple. God spoke to him. The body of Jesus was placed there, a decent burial. And on the third day, Jesus rose again from the dead. And so, it is wonderful to know and understand that the Lord Jesus, he tells his disciples that it is not just something that I've come up with all of a sudden. This is not just a plan or thought that just has come up, but I'm fulfilling prophecies that have been written about me hundreds and hundreds of years ago. And even now, the Lord Jesus, alive. And there are many more prophecies uh, of his second coming to be fulfilled. We can take this assurance and know that every prophecy about his second coming will be fulfilled in the right way, in the right time. All we need to do is to trust in him. We don't have to go searching for events that are happening and then say, okay, this is this is this. Sometimes we may not even understand why, why there are things happening this way. But remember that <clears throat> everything that's happening, God is in control. And I can just picture this whole scenario in Jerusalem. The entire city of Jerusalem, people, thousands of people who followed Jesus. They said, Hosanna to the king. Hosanna to the uh, king of kings. They sang, they put palm leaves and when Jesus rode on the donkey, and now nobody is there. Everyone have gone back to their home saying, okay, forget it. He's been caught. He's going to be crucified. The whole scenario is gloomy. The city of Jerusalem, just a few days before, they were all rejoicing. Miracles and wonders and uh, this man, Jesus, doing these wonderful things. A few days later, everything was quiet. So it teaches us something very important. Through the seasons that God takes us through, God is still God. Even on the cross, Jesus was in authority. The Bible teaches us that he gave up himself. He gave up his life. I, when you look at that, when he was on the cross, he looked up to heavens and he gave up his life. If he wanted, he could say his life could have been there. But he looked up to the Father and he said, I'm ready. 
I fulfilled every prophecy in the Old Testament, and I've made available a new, uh, you know, a new. I've made all things new now for those who believe in me. And so, it's so wonderful to think of the cross. Uh, we'll stop here. Uh, we'll pick up from chapter fifteen, the cross in prophecy from next week. Uh, but here's what I want to encourage each one of us. You know, even as we study all of this, uh, remember how the cross has affected your life. Remember how the cross has, you know, how the Lord Jesus has changed our lives, brought so much of victory, brought power, brought strength into our lives. And so even through the seasons that we go through, I want to encourage us to continue to stay strong. Just as how the Lord Jesus, we study that he went through every temptation. He went through every everything that the enemy tried against him. He overcame. Right? Uh, and so the moment we think about all of these things and he purposed to go to the cross, that really gets me. He purposed, he was, he was waiting for the cross. He purposed it in his heart. So we are to purpose him in our lives and say, God, I, I want you more. Lord, come and make me, make me a new person. Make me grow more in you. Right? The more we do that, the more we will see the power of the cross uh, being released in our lives. Right? Uh, so we'll stop here. Uh, we'll pick up from the cross and prophecy. Uh, we'll go a little quick. I know that a lot of this is. Uh, things that we already know, but there are a few aspects that can refresh us and remind us of what our Lord Jesus did for us. Uh, uh, before I close, just want to remind us that uh, I've put the uh, midterm assessment uh, that's available on the class stream and on the classwork tab. Uh, so I just want to encourage you to begin to work on it uh, and send in the assignments before the due date. Uh, and any assignments sent after the due date will not be marked uh, because I cannot change the due dates. Uh, so please send in those, uh, your midterm assessment. Before the due date, you can just post it in the uh, uh, classwork tab itself. Uh, please don't email it to me personally because I may not know uh, and I'll have to mark it only on the classroom. So uh, please post it on the classwork tab and do it before the due date. Right, uh, shall we close in prayer? Uh, as could any one of us. Rosalind, if you're there, can you please close in prayer? Okay. Um, Jeffina? Yeah, Sid, do you have a question? No process was by mistake. Okay, no problem. John, would you mind closing in prayer? Yeah, let's see. Thanks. Thanks. Father, we want to thank you for this time, Lord. Thank you for enabling us to learn more about the cross, Lord Jesus, today. Lord, we submit us once again to your presence. Lord, we ask, oh God, that we would walk in this revelation. Help us to have this understanding so clearly in our minds that we would be able to apply the benefits that you made possible through the cross, oh God. And we also submit uh, all of us as a class into your hands and ask for your presence to lead us. Um, we thank you for Pastor Paul for elaborating your scripture to us, Lord Jesus. We thank you for what you have done for us, Lord. We give you praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thanks, John. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Have a great week ahead. Uh, see you next Wednesday. God bless.